Okay, if you have your Bibles, turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. We'll conclude our study today in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. This is 10 lessons, and I hope this has been a benefit to you and edified and uh, edification time. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 13 through 17. We started looking at these verses last week, but we'll conclude with these today. 2 Thessalonians 2, 13. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth, whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which we've been taught, whether by word or our epistle. Now, Lord Jesus Christ Himself, and God even our Father, which hath loved us and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your grace. We're thankful, Lord, that we know that you give us comfort and grace, and we know it's through the Word of God. And we're so thankful that we have the Word of God that's complete. We have the final authority in the King James Bible. And we can read it and we enjoy it and study it and, and hide it in our inner, put it in our inner man and build up that house of doctrine in us, Lord, through Romans, through Philemon. Plus, reading the rest of the Bibles for our learning, we're just so thankful today that we have the Word of God. And we pray today that this will be a rich blessing and help to all of us as we study it in 2 Thessalonians 3, or 2 Thessalonians 2, 13 through 17. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. I, I put on the board for you, what's getting you through this life? Now, life's not always easy, and you know that, and the older you get, it seems like there's more difficulties sometimes you have, especially with your health and, and dealing with things, but uh, what's getting you through this life? And the truth will give you comfort. And I'm thankful that the Word of God, the King James Bible, is true, and I think uh, and I know it'll give you comfort if you're willing to believe it. And that's the whole important thing behind it all, is believing what you read. And we're thankful to have the final authority. But I'll say this to you, Satan's attempt is to get rid of the final authority. And he tries every day, he's trying to get rid of the final authority, and he does not want a believer to have what God says. That's it. God's words in this book here, and he, Satan does not want you to know what God says, what God is saying to you. And I'm going to give you an example. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And look at verse 17. 2 Corinthians 4, 17. Paul gives us something here in 2 Corinthians 4, 17. 2 Corinthians 4, 17, and I, that's not the right verse. I'm talking about, this, for we are not as many which corrupt the Word of God. Anybody know what that verse is right now? 2 Corinthians 4, 17 is not it. Uh, but the verse says, for we are not as many which corrupt the Word of God. Is it 2, 17? 2, 17. That's, that's what it is. Thank you. 2 Corinthians 2, 17 for we are not as many which corrupt the Word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God, in the sight of God speak we in Christ. Notice he said, for we are not as many which corrupt the Word of God. Well, how does Satan try to corrupt the Word of God? Well, he'll question God's Word. That's what he does. And that's why so many people will question what God's Word says. Question it. He changed it by subtracting from it and by adding to it. Those are ways there that he uses to try to corrupt the Word of God. And Romans through Philemon are written to believers today. Paul writes these letters. As all of us here know, he's our apostle. He's our spokesperson. And I will say this to you. Uh, when you read Paul's letters, you're going to see the word edify in Romans through Philemon mentioned three times. You're going to see the word edification four times. You're going to see the word edifying eight times. But you don't see those words in any other books in the Bible. You don't see edify. You don't see edification and all. You don't see that in any other books. It's in Paul's letters. 
And Paul gives us this, and when you think about the words edify, edification, edifying, uh, you think about the about building. You know, that's what I'm trying to do, and that's what you're trying to do. We're trying to build, we're trying to edify, build up that house of doctrine in our inner man. And we're building. And when you build up that house of doctrine in Romans 2, 5, Lehman, you're building, you're, get, you're strengthening your inner man, your soul. Your soul is who you are. Uh, this flesh is a container. But my soul inside this container is who I am. And you think about 2 Ephesians chapter 3. Turn it over there, Ephesians chapter 3. I'm just giving you this to kind of introduce the material that I'm going to bring. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 16. You think about building up, edifying, building up that doctrine in your inner man, in your soul. You think about the strength that you get when you do that, when you learn doctrine in Romans 2, 5, Lehman. Well, Ephesians 3, 16 uh, tells us that He would grant you, according to the riches of His glory, to be strengthened with might by His Spirit in the inner man. And that we want to be strengthened uh, by the Spirit in our inner man. We want the house of doctrine built up in us. So, when you think if by taking Romans through Philemon, Paul's our spokesperson, he's our apostle, don't you think building that up, that, that's got to be a big improvement in our lives when we do that. And when people don't do that, they're not living based on who they are in Christ. They're like, they're, people get saved, they learn doctrine, and it's doctrine that's not in Romans 2, 5, Lehman. They're trying to build that up in them. And what they're doing, they're, they're living by the law, and they don't really know they are. And they're walking after that flesh, and they're not, that house of doctrine is not there. The strength is not there. And that wouldn't be an improvement. But if I take the Word of God rightly divided and use Romans and put Romans 2, 5, Lehman, that's to me, and learn that doctrine there in those books. That would be a, a great improvement for me. It would help me because you know what I'm doing? I'm preparing myself for eternity. I'm not preparing for here. Even though I need, I need to have the doctrine in me to live here, but I'm preparing for eternity because that's what's going to be, I'm going to be judged for what's in my soul at the judgment seat of Christ, and that's going to determine what your positions of rank and authority will be in the heavenly places. And that's what a lot of people don't understand and, and don't get a hold of that and there's a lack of maybe knowledge on that part, but we, we need to prepare now for eternity. We need to, because you need the doctrine now to live and you're going to use that doctrine in eternity out there because that's, that's going to determine what you've got position wise. And so we need to build now and think about what God's done for us and you know, the Bible teaches us to edify one another. It's not about just me preaching and teaching to edify you, to build up that house of doctrine in you, but we should edify one another. Uh, look at Ephesians chapter 4 there in verse 12. Ephesians 4, 12. You'll find in Ephesians 4, 11, we'll read verse, those two verses, Ephesians 4, 11. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Now what do we have today? We have more pastors and teachers. Don't we? we have that. We know that. But look, what's for the perfecting of the saints? For the work of the ministry. For the edifying of the body of Christ. And Paul also said about edifying, uh, one may edify another. You can read that in Romans chapter 14. We ought to edify one another. We ought to build one another up. And that's something... It's, it's uh, not necessarily easy to work with people, but on the other hand, you learn to be long-suffering. You learn to be gentle and kind. And you learn to build, the, build up one another instead of tearing one, one another down. So, you know, you think about the work of the ministry. When you read Ephesians 4.12 there, for the perfecting of the saints, you know, building up the saints into mature, per, perfected believers. That's my job as well as a pastor in this work of the ministry so believers can go out and live as mature sons of God. You know, I, I pray that all of us will have the doctrine in us. I pray that we'll build up the doctrine in Romans 2, 5, 8. And Romans is your foundation book. Uh, the cross work of Jesus Christ. The structure of that house 
is Ephesians that we're heavenly people. You put the roof on, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians about the coming of the Lord. He's coming for us. We're going to meet Him in the air as well. We're going to gather with Him, 2nd Thessalonians tells us that. So there's a lot for us to learn and, and we want to live as mature sons of God. And the result of that, the ministry is going to continue. When you, when you learn doctrine and you put that house of doctrine in your inner man, the ministry is going to continue here. And that goes for all other believers in other locations as well. So what we're going to do today, looking at all this, we're going to look at the words here that Paul used to write to these believers to comfort and also to edify them. When you look down and go back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, and you look at verses 13 through 17, and we're just, we can't just go, expound on everything and for any length, but I kind of briefly give you some things about looking at these words that Paul writes to these believers to comfort and edify them. See, when he writes, he edifies. He gives them comfort through the Scripture. He doesn't tear them down. And that's why people today have a tendency, they want to tear people down. And they want to question. You know, you, you, you can read just like I can. We learn what the Word of God says, but edify, build up. And you look at 2 Thessalonians 2.13, and we looked at this last week, but we're bound to give up thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God has from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. Now we looked at from the beginning last week. We understand what beginning. Well, you understand that Paul was, uh, uh, go back, you understand that Israel fell in Acts 7. They blasphemed the Holy Ghost. Saul gets saved in Acts 9. The mystery is given to Paul uh, in the dispensation of grace. So when you look at this here, <clears throat> talking about from the beginning, it's a, it's a dispensation of grace. And talking about the beginning, I chose you to salvation. Well, what salvation? You know, we talked about that last week. These believers were already saved. Say, their salvation has different meanings. It depends on the context in the Bible. What salvation? Sal Y'all should ask, always ask this question, salvation from what? And when you read this, you'll find out in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 through 12, Paul is talking about the tribulation for the most part. He inserts some things about the body of Christ, but tribulation is talking about in verses 3 through 12. He's talking about the day of the Lord. He's talking about the wrath to come. So, Salvation from what? It's from that, from that prophecy program, from that tribulation period, from that wrath to come, from the day of the Lord. So he's talking about that. And you know, we we learned already when you look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, he starts out, he talks about, it, about there in verse 2 about the, they were shaken in mind by the letter. And then he talks about the man of sin in verse 3, the, the son of perdition in verse 4. That's the Antichrist. We talked all about that. But he inserts there in verse 6, and now we know what withhold us that he might be revealed in his time. If you've missed out on this, the what there, and now you know what withhold us that he might be revealed. The what's the dispensation of grace. That's what's holding back withhold us he that might be revealed. That's the Antichrist. Verse 7, for the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he, notice the word he, who now let it let until he be taken out of the way. Well, who's going to be taken out of the way? The body of Christ. And once we're taken out of the way, read on in verse 8, and even uh, and then shall that wicked be revealed. That's the Antichrist. So after we're gone, there's still going to be a period of time, but the Antichrist will be revealed after we're gone. So this, this plainly teaches you we're not part of the tribulation. And I, I can't emphasize that enough to you there. So salvation from what? Salvation from the tribulation period, from the day of the Lord, and also the wrath to come. Now then, going on to 2 Thessalonians 3, 14, and we'll take up there, it says, whereunto he called you by our gospel. See how Paul is, he's giving comfort to these believers at Thessalonica. They need it. They're going through some things in their life. They've been shaken up. So he's telling them, whereunto he called you by our gospel. So call there. You look at that word call. What's it mean? It means to be given an invitation. I was given an invitation. When? When I heard the gospel. I had an opportunity to either receive, believe it, or reject it. So, how does God call us? 
Verse 14 there, uh, 2 Thessalonians 2, 14, by our gospel. I mean, the Bible tells you there. Paul tells you, we're to be called you by our gospel. And we know what the gospel is. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, we know that. That Christ died for our sins, and that he was buried, and that he rose again. You look in Romans 3, 21 through 28 there, about the, uh, the cross work of Jesus Christ, what he did for us. And uh, so uh, that's how God calls us, by our gospel. Well, why is our gospel important there? I mean, he emphasizes those believers there. You notice that when he writes this, he's writing to the Thess believers of, Thess of the Thessalonica, and he says, Word two, he called you by our gospel. So, why is our, our gospel important there when he writes this? Well, it's the gospel of grace. And here's, you, you'll find the gospel of grace, you'll find grace throughout Romans 2 Philemon. I'm going to give you an example. I'll use Acts. Acts is a transition book. You don't build doctrine on Acts unless it's in Romans 2, Philemon. But look here what it says about the gospel of grace. Look in Acts chapter 20 and verse 24. Acts chapter 20 and verse 24. This is a good verse to mark and to know where it's at. Acts chapter 20 and verse 24. And if you look in the context, all the way up to verse 16 there, Acts 20, 16, it talks about Paul there had determined to sail by Ephesus and you rule on out down what Paul says and you get to Acts 20:24. 20, but none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear to myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. And you look at the gospel to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Well, did Paul testify the gospel of the grace of God? If you'll look at 1 Timothy chapter 2 and look at that testify. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and look at verse 16. 1 Timothy 2, 16. And as you're turning there, I'll keep my place in Acts 20, 24. He said, I, uh, Paul talked about, I have received the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. And look what he says in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 6. 1 Timothy 2, 6. Paul says, Who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Well, who's testifying that? That Christ died for sin, was buried and raised again, the gospel of grace. Paul, Paul did. And he's given it to us. And that's why he says in verse 4 there, 1 Timothy 2, 4, Who will have all men to be saved and to come with the knowledge of the truth. And look at verse 5. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Notice about Christ Jesus. who gave himself for a ransom for all. He died for all. To be testified in due time. And Paul says in verse 7. Whereunto I am ordained a preacher and an apostle. I speak the truth in Christ and lie not. A teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. So Paul, he's telling you right there. In verse 7. I'm ordained a preacher and an apostle. I speak the truth of Christ, and why not? A teacher of the Gentiles. Paul's telling you there, he's different from the twelve apostles. I mean, all you got to do is read that and believe what you read. Like I said, uh, the Bible's there too far, but the problem is it's hard to believe sometimes. And that, that's the problem we have and we have issues with. So when you think about 2 Thessalonians, and you go back over there in verse 14, and look at this verse again, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and verse 14. And Paul tells, Whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory uh, uh, of our Lord Jesus Christ. So he called, his, you know, it's the gospel of the grace of God. Well, you compare that to the gospel of the kingdom, and all of us here know this. We know if you go to Matthew 4 and talk about what did Jesus preach in his earthly ministry, uh, that there's a difference. Matthew chapter 4 and verse 23. Matthew 4, 23. Paul preached the gospel of the grace of God. Well, what did the Lord Jesus Christ preach in his earthly ministry? Matthew 4, 23. And Matthew 4, 23. And it says in Matthew 4, 23, And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. Now that's not hard to see there when you see that. But, but you, when you rightly divide the Word of God, you know 
the Lord Jesus Christ and His earthly minister, He preached the gospel of the kingdom. We know Paul, when he was saved, the Lord Jesus Christ gave him the mystery, and he preached the gospel of the grace of God and the dispensation of grace. So, what is the gospel of the grace of God? Romans 3, 21, I said earlier, through 28 there, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. You know, I believe the gospel, just like you heard it and you believed it. And when you do that, you become a member of the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians 12, 27. And that's what we are. We're members of His body. And that's why people a lot of times don't realize what they have. I was telling a person yesterday, whenever you believe the gospel, uh, you've heard that Christ died for your sins and He was buried and raised again, you know you're a sinner. And what do you do? You believe. You trust Him. That's what believing is, trust Him. He, that's when He saves you. You believe the gospel. He saves you. Well, you got to believe to be saved. Regardless of who you are. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Turn there. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And look at verse 21. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 21. In 1 Corinthians 1, 21. For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Now that tells you right there, you're not going to be saved unless you believe. And what are you going to believe? You're going to have to believe the gospel. That Christ died for your sin, was buried and raised again. You're not going to heaven any other way. But you've got to believe it to save them that believe. And you notice there, the wisdom of God in 1 Corinthians there, in verse 21, for that for after that in the wisdom of God the world by wisdom knew not God it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe and you, you need to keep that verse marked there you got to believe the gospel to be saved turn back to 2 Thessalonians now verse 14 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 14 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 14 And when you look at 2 Thessalonians 2.14, he's writing now in verses 13 through 17, he's, he's give, giving those uh, believers the comfort through the Scriptures. He wants to uh, establish them. Uh, and you'll read that in verse 17. But in 2 Thessalonians 2.14, notice what it says there also. For unto he called you by our gospel, we know what the gospel is, death, burial, and resurrection, to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, notice that the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to get a glorified body like His. We're going to live in glory with Him. and that, So that's what we're, we're going to have. But what are we going to obtain that believe the gospel? The glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm, I'm repeating myself, but I, I did it on purpose. We're going to get that glory. And that's something to be thankful for and understand. You know, when you look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, for example, Paul writes this letter, and a lot of times you'll read, like in 2 Thessalonians, this letter's got three chapters, and a lot of times you'll read, and you may not pick up sometimes on what you should. Paul speaks about the rapture and the second coming in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. And when you look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7, and to you who are troubled, rest with us. Comma. See, there's a comma there. It's talking about those believers. When, notice that, when the Lord Jesus Christ shall be revealed from heaven with His mighty angels, come, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. Well, when's that? He's telling those believers that's the second coming there. You see that? When you look at 2 Thessalonians 1, 7, you've got a comma after us, when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. That's the second coming. You can't miss that. Well, look at 2 Thessalonians 1 10. When, you got starts off with when, he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe. Now, notice the parentheses. And this parentheses is important because our testimony among you is believed in that day. Now, that's the rapture there in verse 10. 
So, I mean, you talk about because our testimony among you, he's writing to believers among you, was believed in that day. So you've got both. You've got, you've got the second coming, you've also got the rapture uh, there. And that parenthesis helps us to understand that. Uh, and you know, as believers, we will spend eternity in glory. You know why? Because we believe the gospel. And you know what? It was a gift to us. All we can do is believe it. And by believing it, we trust in Christ and he, the gifts given to us, eternal life. And so we're going to spend eternity there. So he's writing this to the believers at Thessalonica, and they were shaken up. Well, you look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 again, verse 15. The word therefore, when, you know, for that reason. You think about for that reason, therefore. Well, what reason? We're into he called you of our gospel, verse 14. To the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you've been taught, whether by word or our epistle. So it doesn't matter what you go through in life. I mean, what's getting you through this life? And you read that right there in verse 14, and you know how we're, we're called by our gospel, we're saved, and we were the obtaining the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to, we're waiting on glory. We're waiting on something far better than this. I mean, if there wasn't anything going on, any virus or any wars or anything else going on, uh, if life was as calm as it could be, it doesn't. Need, this life doesn't compare to what we're going to have in glory. And therefore, you see, it, verse 15, these believers were going through a lot, and I'll share with you what what all they were going through. Therefore, brethren, uh, stand fast. Now that's something important there. Stand fast. It's better to stand fast. If you compare stand fast to verse 2. 2 Thessalonians 2.2. 2. Notice what it says there in verse 2. That ye, not be, that ye be not soon shaken in mind. They weren't standing fast. They were shaken up. They were shaken in mind. And they were upset about that letter that they had received. Turn now to Philippians chapter 4 about stand fast. Philippians chapter 4, and look at verse 1. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 1. We're talking about stand fast. In Philippians chapter 4 and verse 1, Therefore, you know, for that reason, what's been said in the previous chapter, Therefore, my dearly beloved, my, therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved, and long for my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. Notice up there, Paul is not saying stand fast for the Lord. A lot of people get that all messed up. He didn't say stand fast for the Lord. He said stand fast in the Lord. Paul's saying take your stand on what God's done for you. Well, what's God done for me? He saved me when I believed the gospel, and He baptized me by His Spirit, Holy Spirit in His body. In His body, I'm sealed until the day of redemption. I've, I've, I've obtained it, the inheritance. I'm going to receive that glory one day. I mean, that, you, you, you can go on and talk about, I've been blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, just like you. Ephesians 1 and verse 3. So, stand. Stand fast. Well, look at what the Galatians did. Here they are. They're believers. But look what they did in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 1. Talking about standing fast. And he, Paul writes it to the church of Thessalonica and tells them to stand fast. Well, look what the Galatians did in Galatians 5 and verse 1. Paul says, Paul says, all of you know they went back under the law. That's what they did. Well, Galatians 5, 1, Paul says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty of the world of Christ has made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Well, what's that yoke of bondage? That's the law. And he says, Stand fast there, therefore, in the liberty of the world of Christ has made us free. When you stand fast in that liberty, what is that? That's grace. That's not law. And that, that's the grace. And that's why we're to walk in, we're, we're free to walk in righteousness uh, in, in Christ Jesus. Now go back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And look at verse 15 again. Paul says, Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you have been taught. Well, What's he talking about the, the, the tradition which you've been taught? Taught by Paul's epistles. That's what he's talking about. Paul taught them by word. I mean, when he was with them at Thessalonica, he taught them. 
Paul's writing 1st and 2nd Thessalonians to them. He's taught them by letter. And guess what? We've got 13 letters that Paul writes written down for us, and he's teaching us by letters too. Romans through Philemon. And yet, people do not want to hear what Paul said. And Paul's going to address that here in, in the, these verses. And Paul, so Paul taught them personally. Now, when you look, look at verse 16, now. I mean, you, you get that clear there. You know, who's taught you? The only way you can be saved is through Romans through Philemon. Apostle Paul tells you how to be saved. You can't be saved in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It's got to be. The book of Romans is the cross work of Jesus Christ. That tells you how to be saved. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4 tells you how to be saved. So you can't be saved outside of Paul's letters. Well, look what Paul says there in verse 16. Now, 2 Thessalonians 2, 16. Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself come, and God even our Father, which hath loved us, and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope, through grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. Look what Paul, Paul's seeking to, what's he trying to accomplish here in these verses? He wants to comfort their hearts and he wants to establish them in every good work, word and work. So, chapter 2, when you look at chapter 2, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, Paul wants to do two things for these believers. The purpose is to comfort and restabilize these believers. He wants to give them comfort and restabilize their minds because they've been shaken. And, and they're not what they ought to be based on that. And he also wants to encourage them to get on with the ministry. You've got to go on with the ministry. You can be shaken up, but the Word of God is here for you and it'll give you comfort, it'll give you grace. You can be shaken up during this time and go through things in, in this trying time we're living in today, but the Word of God is here to give you comfort the Word of God is here to establish us in every good word and work. He'll encourage you. Now it says in verse 16 again, Now our Lord Jesus Christ Himself and God, even our Father. Well, why is this phrase important? When you read that there in 2 Thessalonians 2.16, Now our Lord Jesus Christ Himself, comma, and God, comma, even our Father, comma. Well, why is that all that important there? Well, if you compare that, to 2 Thessalonians 2, 2, that ye may not be soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us. See, the letter was not from Paul, as that the day of Christ is at hand. So there's a difference there. When you read verse 2, about that letter, as from us, and you compare that to 2 Thessalonians 2, 16, now our Lord Jesus Christ Himself and God even our Father, which hath loved us, hath given us everlasting consolation, good hope through grace. I mean, there's something there that, you, you, that we, we need to see there. What was the false letter, letter saying? Well, the false letter saying really it was from Paul, and it was not from Paul. As from us. Paul didn't write it. Well, what authority does 2 Thessalonians 2 have? That's what you're looking at. What authority does 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 have? Well, second, the authority comes from verses, verse 16. Our Lord Jesus Christ Himself and God, even our Father. There's the authority. You see that? It's not comparing that, the authority, with verse 2, the letter, as from us. As from us is not the authority. There's a lot of letters out there today, as from us. There's a lot of translations out there today, as from us but they're not the authority. And that's what I want you to see there. Uh, so who are we believing when we believe Paul's message? That, that's what you need to look at. Who are we believing when we believe Paul's message? Well, turn for an example. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 13. 2 Corinthians 13. Who are we believing when we believe Paul's message? 2 Corinthians 13, 3. All of you know the issue that the Corinthians had. They were carnal. They were they didn't have that house of doctrine in, in their inner man like they should. Well, 2 Corinthians 13, 3, Paul says, Since ye seek a proof of Christ speaking in me. Notice that. They were they wanted to see, see the proof of Christ speaking in me, which to you were is not weak, but is mighty in you. So who who is speaking through Paul? 
the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, who gave Paul the dispensation of grace? The Lord Jesus Christ. All you got to do is read Ephesians chapter 3, and you see that, and we won't take time to do that there. So you see the authority. And you know, you see what 2 Corinthians 13, 3 is saying, since you seek a proof of Christ speaking in me, well, that's what we hear all over the land today. It, is, is Paul really our apostle? Well, he is, because the Bible tells us he is. But yet, we have people that question that. Why do you follow Paul? Well, he's my apostle, Romans 11, 13. Just believe the Bible and see what's happening. People don't believe the Word of God. And that's why I said, what's getting you through this life? Well, I'll tell you what's getting me through. It's the Word of God, rightly divided. That's what gets me through it, this life. And so, go back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and look at verse 15. 2 Thessalonians 2, 15. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the tradition which you've been taught, whether by word or our epistle. Uh, notice that our epistle. Well, that's Paul's. You see that? And then look at verse 16. Now, Lord Jesus Christ himself, see now, you've got our Lord Jesus Christ, you've got our epistle, you've got our Lord Jesus Christ, and in verse 16, talks about in God, even our Father. Now you have even our Father. You've got all three. And we know God, the Holy Spirit, wrote it, wrote the, the Word. So you've got the Godhead, so you've got all. So why is Paul showing the connection with himself, the Father and the Son? Well, the issue is authority. That's the issue. And these believers need to make a decision. Who are we going to believe? Are we going to believe 2 Thessalonians 2, 2 about the letter as from us? Or are we going to believe what Paul is saying here in, in verses 13 through 17? Talking about our epistle, talking about our Lord Jesus Christ, Christ talking about our Father. Now which one are you going to believe? And that, that's the choice that they have to make there. And uh, this is, that was going to be a challenge for, for those believers. They were shaken up. You have to remember that. Well, you know what? It's a challenge today. You, with all people all across this land you talk to, you have to understand that is a challenge. And whenever you bring up something about the King James Bible, you've got to be prepared to give, give verses. And you can't let people get you frustrated and upset and all that. If you can't do that, you don't need to bring it up. But I'm saying that is a challenge today. Look at verse 16, St. Thessalonians 2, 16. Now, Lord Jesus Christ Himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us. No that. Well, that goes back to the cross. His love for us. How much the Father loved us, He sent His Son and died for us. There's the cross. Well, look here at this verse. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 5. It's amazing what you can get when you study. And we all need to do more. I need to do more. You look at 2 Thessalonians 3 and verse 5. And the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God, comma, and to the patient waiting for Christ. Let me ask you, what do you see in verse 2 Thessalonians 3, 5? Now the Lord Jesus, now the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God, comma. When was that? First coming? Or what? Or what? That's the first coming. You see that? And, and the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God. That's when He came the first time, His earthly ministry. And to the patient waiting for Christ. When's that? That's when He comes. We're going to meet Him there. That's the rapture. So you have both there. You, know? you have the first coming, you have the rapture. And then going back to 2 Thessalonians uh, chapter 2 there, in verse 16, notice it says in the last part of that verse, well, I'll read the whole verse again. 2 Thessalonians 2 16. And our Lord Jesus Christ Himself come, and God come, even our Father come, which hath loved us and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace. Notice that, hath given us everlasting consolation. How long is that, that consolation? It's everlasting. It's forever. And He's given us that. And these believers were going through persecution and tribulation. How do we know that? Look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 4. In 2 Thessalonians 1 4, they were going through persecution and tribulation. 1 4, so that we ourselves glory you in the church of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure. 
They were going through persecutions and tribulations themselves. Plus, they got shaken up in mind. They had that going on. And, but one day, uh, we're going to have everlasting consolation. We have comfort today through the Word of God. We're going to have everlasting one day. You know, it doesn't make any difference what happens down here on this earth. And that's what all of us need to get in our minds today. Regardless of what happens to you on this earth, it doesn't matter. Because one day we're going to be in glory with that glorified body. And we're going to have that everlasting consolation and comfort with the Lord. So it doesn't matter. In the end, it's just glory for us because we're saved. Everlasting consolation, that's a source of encouragement. That will encourage you against fainting, giving up, growing weary, and being intimidated. And you know, we all face all that stuff. Intimidation. We get, we'll get intimidated if you don't watch what you're doing. But you think about everlasting consolation. First, verse 16 again says, And good hope through grace. It's good hope. And I, I, there's verses that we could run on that. I'll give you this one. It's close. Good hope. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 1. Talking about good hope. 1 Timothy 1 and 1. You know, you think about good hope. This is good hope. 1 Timothy 1 and 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, with the will of, by the commandment of God our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope. Isn't that good hope? And you got hope like that, you can't go wrong. I'm talking about Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope. The Lord Jesus Christ is our hope. And notice there in 2 Thessalonians 2.16, it's in good hope, it's through grace. How? How is it through grace? By the Word of God. And that's by believing what you read, rightly dividing the Word of truth. And this is what Paul said at the end, verse 17. 2 Thessalonians 2.17 He said, Comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. You know, comfort your hearts, and that's, that's through the Word of God. And by believing. And establish you. You know when you're established, you're stable. That's edification. And if you don't put that, build up that doctrine in you, you're not established. And look what happens when you're established. You're, you get comfort in the Word of God, you're established, in every good word. Well, that good word there, if you go to Timothy and around, that's sound doctrine. The good word will establish you, make you stable by the doctrine. And, and, and whenever you do that, whenever you let the word give you comfort, whatever time you're going through today, hit the word of God, let it give you comfort. Let it give you grace. Let it establish us in every good word, sound doctrine. And work. Notice that in verse 17. That, that sound doctrine will teach us to do good works and the power to do that. We can work. We can continue on in the work of the ministry by the doctrine in us. So he writes that letter to those believers. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 is a wonderful chapter. And that ought to be encouragement. You're not going through the tribulation. We're not in the prophecy program. We're in the, we're in the dispensation of grace. We're the body of Christ. And not only that, regardless of what I go through, sickness or whatever, God will give me comfort in His Word. And He wants me to be established, stable. He wants me to, in every good word, that sound doctrine, have that doctrine in me and work. Carry on with the ministry, regardless of what situation that we're in. So, what's getting you through this life? And I can say this, the Word of God is, rather than the Bible. That's what's getting us through.